I think one of the things that I found either that I gravitated towards in the Marine Corps, the Marine Corps taught me, or maybe it's, it was natural to me, is the ability to organize and build repeatable processes. If you think about the military and probably law enforcement to a large degree, you need to repeat the same thing over and over again with new people all the time. So you have to build effective processes to train people to get things done to accomplish the same sorts of things over and over again, but with new people. You're always getting new people, but the mission stays the same to a large degree, right? So you learn how to build process. You learn how to implement process and organization and you learn how to train people because those same people need to be able to do the job and understand what has to get done. If you need 10 people to do it, but now you only have six, you still have to get the job done. So you end up training people that way. And that sort of lends itself to operations in general, you know, the training of people that working with HR, implementing the right systems to optimize what the company needs to do, you know, shrink the, the workforce down naturally so you don't have to have so many people to do the same thing and that just started to sort of be how i was proceeding in my career and what was making me successful was leveraging that and building upon that Welcome to the Transition Drill Podcast. I'm your host, Paul Pantiani. I appreciate you taking the time to watch. So let's get into this. You're involved in triathlon. I am. I just completed my first full Ironman two weeks ago. Congratulations. Which one did you do? Sacramento. How would you like it? You know, I I liked it a lot. Right, I've done some half Ironmans before as my first full. So, you know, I enjoyed the challenge of doing it. The day itself was a little brutal little brutal i didn't hurt my uh, calf during training so you know i thought the run was going to hurt a little bit sure enough we had 30 mile an hour plus winds on the bike and just burned out my calves on the bike so i got on the run started out strong said wow i'm going a lot faster than i thought <laughs> i was going to go and then about six miles in it's just nothing but pain yeah for the next 20 miles but and in hindsight, when you when you start out and look out, and go, oh, I'm faster than I thought I was. That's usually not going to end well. Yeah, no. I mean, I, so I, when I went into it, I said, okay, if I have a great day, I'll finish at 12 hours. If I have a good day, I'll finish at 13 hours. And I finished at 13:04. So I guess all in all, I had a good day. You know, but I was I was limping for the, the next day. <laughs> How many years you've been doing it? Uh, well, triathlons. I guess I've been doing now about five or six years. You know, I, you know, I got into it. My, my buddy here in town, uh, I was talking to him about my bucket list of doing a marathon. He's like, well, you can do the Carlsbad. It's coming up in four months. You got time to train. I said, okay. Yeah. You know what? I'll do that. So I did that, started doing a couple marathons and half marathons. And then he led on that he has done six Ironmans. Uh oh. And he's like, Hey, <laughs> we, we should do a triathlon challenge accepted. And I'm like, okay, yeah, let's do one. He took me to this one in San Diego, just, uh, an Olympic distance. So it's, uh, much shorter. I mean, San Diego International. Uh, it wasn't in. I don't know. It was, it was called the uh, Rock the Bay okay. Triathlon, but it was a Olympic distance, and I did not train well enough for. Thinking, you know, I run and I ride all the time. No big deal. I used to be a good swimmer. Hell, the Marine Corps sent me to swim instructor school. Right. <laughs> the swim killed me. That was, it was a brutal. I was like, oh, I hate this. But I was hooked. I was like, okay, I got to do better next time. So now I got to do another one. So do you have? Uh, do you already have your next full Ironman on your horizon? No, because. Um, before I commit to that, I need to give some time back at home. Got it. Right. Because my wife was like, look, every weekend, all you do is train and we got things around here that have to get done. So I didn't want to jump right back in and say, Hey, guess what? I signed up for this next one before I get a few things done at home. That was, and the reason why I'm circling back around to this is because 2023 is 20 years for me since I did my Ironman. Oh, you did one. Oh, and, um, it, it feels like an eternity ago, but I was just having a conversation with my wife because a good friend of ours has gotten into it and he's getting ready. I want to say he's doing the La Quinta um, half coming up here pretty soon. Oh yeah. I looked at that. The water co looks cold. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I told her, you know, uh, there's that little part of me that misses it. it. It's, it's that training with a specific purpose in mind. 
you know, I enjoy working out. I, I, you know, it, and it, it motivates me and drives me. And sure. But having a specific goal on the flip side though, I've got no equipment anymore. I've completely separated from it other than, yes, I have running shoes and, and I, on occasion I will get out now and run, but the costs of getting back into it. Yeah. I mean, the bike alone is going to cost you between three and five grand for a medium. Uh, yeah. yeah. Nothing great. <laughs> right. Uh, you know, wetsuits you can pick up, not too bad, but it requires a commitment to the training. Well, and, and you, you mentioned, you know, your wife was talking about the, the demands and your separation from, from home. And when I've talked to people about do stepping up to an Ironman was a completely different yeah. beast from two parts. If you even factor in your family for them to go watch you, it, you want to talk about the ultimate boredom. Oh, yeah. There's nothing because unless you're lucky enough to do a course that, that maybe you might pass them multiple times, you like you said, 13 hours, what are they going to do? Sit there and twiddle your thumbs. Um, but what I've told people for me was it was a, at minimum part-time job. It was 20 hours per week Yeah, that, that I was committed to this. And, and like you said, on a Saturday and Sunday, you're talking about, a four to five hour bike ride and then bricking it into an hour run or a yeah. swim. And so it's, it's a huge demand when you have a family. No, it is. And one of the things I do like about what they've done now with the Ironman app, the family can follow you on the app and where you're at in the course and what your people. Oh, it shows you how long is. I've been. Yeah. It's actually kind of cool. It. So we, I mean, we sent them out to, so my buddy who got me into it, he ran it with me too. We sent the links out to all of our friends and they're tracking us the whole race. Like, yeah, we watched you start slowing down on the run, <laughs> slowing down and slowing down. It's yeah. funny. You mentioned though, in injuring your calf because I remember <clears throat> doing mine and I was what let me take a step back here you you mentioned you've cycled and ran and then did swimming in the Marine Corps and I want to get into a little bit more obviously of your growing up life but was it something of the three sports that you've done for a long time running so for me when I got into triathlon it was I I'd always peripherally been involved in cycling I'd always enjoyed it I'd but being a bigger guy, 6'1", 200 pounds, I was never adept at being a good cyclist. And so I stumbled into it simply because I was getting some running injuries. And a, and a friend at the time who was doing triathlons, like, hey, jump in the pool and you're a triathlete. And so I was using the swimming to compensate for not being able to run. Mm. And so I did all my training leading up into my Ironman race, came off the bike, and I'm, I'm about a mile and a half, two miles into it. And all of a sudden, the bottom of my foot is hurting like it's never hurt before. And looking back on it, what had happened was I got a flat during the bike portion. And when my feet were wet, pumping the, the, the tire and doing all that, working it, I had rubbed it probably uh. a little raw on, you know, in the shoe. Long story short, I'm running this thing and I'm, I'm like, well, if I'm injuring my foot, I'll deal with it when I'm done with this yeah. race. I'm not this far into it and going to quit now. And so I was fortunate that it was not a, a significant injury that laid me out or, or was, you know, something where I couldn't recover from it. But I do remember and when you mentioned, you know, your calf started to yeah. just having that moment in my head going, should I stop? Should I not stop? Should I stop? Should I not stop? Yeah. There was no way I was, I was going to stop. I was like, I spent too much time training for this. I, I knew going in that uh, this might start to irritate me. It's right where the, uh, the calf muscle attaches the, the Achilles tendon attaches the heel and it would just, Got into it. It's like, oh, this is painful. But you know what? It's another four or five hours and it's done. You know, just <laughs> suck it up. You can deal with it later on. And I'm glad I did. Very cool. You know. Let's take fun. you backwards. Sure. Where's hometown for you? You know what? I would consider Temecula Murrieta hometown now because I've been here since the Marine Corps transferred me here in 93 and I've never left. Where'd so you, I, where did you grow up? Well, that's what's difficult. I moved around a lot when I was younger, but sort of in the South San Francisco Bay area, San Jose, uh, Cupertino, uh, Sunnyvale, that sort of area. And then uh, my junior year in high school, we moved to Carmel. Okay. So I went to high school. My Horrible last place to live. You know, as an adult, it's a great place. As a teenager, <laughs> it is terrible. There's nothing There's there nothing for a kid to do. <laughs> There's nothing to do. It's difficult to get in trouble, right? And I tried. But there's just nothing to do out there. What moved your family so much? My mom ended up, well, after she, her and my dad got divorced, and then she was teaching at the Monterey Institute of International Studies. She was working out there. It's one, one of the colleges out there. So she was making the drive from San Jose out to Monterey, about an hour and a half drive each way. And then eventually she's like, no, we're, we're just going to move. Brothers, sisters? Younger brother. He's out in uh, Minnesota right now. He's been out there for 
as long as I've longer than I've been out here. And what about you personally? What did you enjoy as a kid? Were you a sports guy? Were you? Yeah, I think I was. I mean, I, I enjoyed when I was a kid. I thought I was going to be in the NFL. I wanted to play football. That's all I ever wanted to do. And my mom was adamantly opposed to that. <laughs> she would not let me play football until I got into high school. Not anything except flag football. But yeah, I, I, was, I ran track and I uh, liked to play football. As a kid growing up, did you have, what were your aspirations for adulthood? I was going to be a cop. That's what I was going to do. In fact, that's just before I joined the Marine Corps. At 20, I put myself through the police academy in, in Gilroy. And it was taking forever to get, to get hired. So I went back to college and then was working as a tow truck driver to pay my rent and could not do both. So I started uh, just working full time. And after about two months, I said, look, I do not want to be a tow truck driver for the rest of my life. <laughs> so, so, but what can I do? I'm not getting hired fast enough because I, I was barely 21, didn't have a college degree, just, you know, high school only. So, well, I'll just join the military for four years and uh, earn money for college. So I figured if I'm going to join the military, then... I want to have the biggest adventure I can. Have. So what, what branch is that going to be? So <laughs> that's the Marine Corps. In high school, was there aspirations for college? Not really. I wasn't really big into the academic side. I hadn't thought about college. I hadn't thought about a career. You know, I think looking back, it's one of the things that I probably tried to teach my daughter differently. It's like, look, let's look, look ahead a little more than just worrying about what you're doing today. Cause I, I didn't look ahead enough. Did you have people in your life, though, either from the law enforcement side or the military side who were kind of even unofficial mentors kind of guiding you? I don't know. I probably didn't. My dad was very, you know, kind of hands off with it. He was in business. Um, didn't say too much. My grandfather was uh, a former police officer up around Fresno, but he didn't talk about it a lot. But he, that's what he had done earlier in his life. What, so you graduated high school what year? 84 but did not immediately go into the military. The three years in between, just kind of odd jobs? Odd jobs, yeah. Traveled a little bit, got a weird job selling magazines door-to-door, -door, traveling around the U.S. when I was uh, 18. Did that for six months. So this this is terrible. <laughs> Ended up meeting a girl and moving to Tucson with her. The uh, manager of a shoe store for a while. I was the original Al Bundy <laughs> at, at 18 or 19. Um, like, I don't like this either. Let's go, let's go back home and try to figure out something else to do. And that's when I went back home and said, okay, uh, I've always liked the idea of, of law enforcement, be a cop. Let's, how do I go about doing this? Uh, did what research was available back in the mid eighties. There was no internet. Right. Said, okay, what do I do? Said, okay, well I can wait till I'm 21. And right now, back then, not a lot of the agencies required college degrees. You could still get hired as high school, but you had to be 21. Right. And I was only 20. So what am I going to do? So, well, I can put myself through the academy, pay for it myself, 16 weeks in the academy. And I'll almost be 21 by the time I get it. I was still 20 when I graduated. And then I'll have that kind of certification behind me. It might be easier to get hired. Was that a full-time academy? Yeah. So you basically had no means of, of working while you were going to the academy? No, it was full-time. 16 weeks full-time full academy. And when you came out, just couldn't get picked up anywhere? Yeah, I couldn't. So... Couldn't get picked up. And a couple of times I made it through all the way through the world boards. And I thought I had done, done well. And finally, uh, I didn't get picked up on Seaside PD. And I was living in Monterey, Carmel area. And I got a hold of the lieutenant. And I said, look, what is it? Why am I not getting picked up? And he said, look, normally I wouldn't tell you this. But the problem is you've got a bill in collections. He said, you're never going to get hired when you have bills and collections. When I lived in Arizona, right. I made a dumb credit mistake <laughs> and had never paid this, this credit card off. I'm like, oh, shoot. So I didn't realize that at the time. And that's what was holding me back. So worked to get that paid off while I put myself back to school, working as a tow truck driver and just wasn't getting picked up fast enough. And I didn't want to work full time as a tow truck driver or anything else. So, so I'll go get my degree after I do what was supposed to be four years. I was going to say, so going into the Marine Corps, your plan was four years and out. Yeah. And into it, how soon did you make the kind of the mental mindset change that, wait a minute, maybe it's not going to be four years. You know, I think it was after we got back from the Gulf war. It's like, you know, I'm enjoying this. You know, there's all kinds of cool training. They keep sending me off on. I keep going to different places. Um, it's always fresh and exciting. So 
maybe I'll just do another four years. No pressure. But this time, I don't want to stay in Camp Lejeune. <laughs> so if I re-up, can you send me out to the, the West Coast where I'm from, please? And did you get to Pendleton? Or? Yeah, got to Pendleton first. Um, did four more years here at Pendleton and then went down to San Diego, three years as a drill instructor. And then, then I came back for another year, and that's when I got out. And we kind of talked about this previously, but what was it that forced you to make the trans- transition out early? Because you didn't end up doing a career. No, I know I didn't. So I think there was a, there were a couple of factors. One, I was in artillery in the Marine Corps. Never, I mean, artillery itself is not that exciting, right? There's some aspects of it that are fun at times. But well, especially if not on the receiving end of it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. <laughs> but it's funny, when I, when I joined the Corps, because I, I walked in the recruiter's office and said, look, I, I want to join. He said, but I said, what's the job where I've got a rifle and a pack? That's what I want to do. Because I wanted the adventure. That's the Marine Corps. Yeah. <laughs> and he said, well, that's combat arms. I'm like, okay, sign me up. Signed up for it. And back then, you would get your MOS uh, getting out of boot camp. And so a drill instructor at the time is reading off names and MOSs, uh, borders, 0811. I'm like, what's that, sir? Tanks. I said, tanks? <laughs> he said, no, it's artillery. I'm like, I, I'm an idiot at the time. Sir, I, there's, a, there's a mistake. I'm supposed to be infantry. Shut up, sit down. <laughs> a couple other curse words. The artillery. I went and talked to somebody like, no, nope. so are you sorry you signed combat arms. It's any one of these jobs. <laughs> so never trust the recruiter. So you, you got out after how many years? Uh, 12 years, 12 year, 12 and a half years. And leading into that, coming out of that initial transition, did you have a plan for yourself or? Yeah, I did actually. So um, in my last few years in the Marine Corps, I started to get into without any prior uh, knowledge, experience, or desire into computers. It was, you know, right around 96, 97, the internet started coming up. I got my first computer. I was like, man, it's pretty good. I started using it uh, in the core. So like building out load plans for when we're going to head out to the field. I started using databases and I was working on this old 286 with a little floppy. I was like, why would anybody need more space? This is all I ever need. And then I got another computer. I was like, oh, it's just... You know, this is just so much more. Then I started to figure out, oh, I can build them and I can do more. And then I started getting into it some more. I said, oh, this, you know, we started getting networks on the base and email. And I said, you know, how do you, how do you work this? How do you do this? I started doing it myself. And then I said, oh, you know what? People have a career in this. So what I did at the time is I bought myself this giant set of books, Microsoft books, looked at the Microsoft certification. At the time it was a Microsoft certified systems engineer. I said, what do I need to do to get that? And it was a series of, I think, seven or eight different tests that Microsoft administered. And so I started studying the books, building the networks at home, building the computers, working on all this stuff. And I'd go down and I think te- each test was like 150 bucks or something until I got my certification, my MCSE. So I knew that I had to have something getting out of the core because you get out of the core and it's just to go straight into the civilian world. What do you do? Why pull string, go boom. Because you know, nobody needs me to do that, despite you know, what I thought about later on and the leadership you bring to a position. But still, there was no hard skills. So I said, no, I'm going to get into be a network administrator, systems analyst type of thing. Were you seeing that that was a growing industry at the time? Yeah, I was. And that's one of the other things I looked at. Uh, as I mentioned earlier before we started, uh, my daughter had been living with her mom. And she called me one day like, Dad, can I come live with you? Uh, I won't get into the drama of it, but I'm like, Certainly, please, you know, come live with me. But then it's just me. And I've got a 14-year-old daughter at home. It's like, yeah, you know, the core isn't really good for single parenthood, especially when you've got a Marine a dad and daughter. a teenage daughter at home. So, yeah, you know, it's probably a good time, but I need to make sure I can support us all. And this looked like an industry that was growing. That I could make, in my estimation, more doing that than I could being in the core. I said, okay, either I get out now. If I do another four years, then I might as well stay for 20 because it'll be 16 then. And so that's when I made the call. So I, I'll get out and go do this. Now, with doing all of this, were you able to get through all of the tr- that Microsoft training before you got out? Yeah, I did it all, all myself all before I got out. Was the Marine Corps leveraging that skill set while you were still in? So for my last six months in, I had a really good sergeant major. So I, I was at the time battery gunny of Echo 211. 
And I told Sergeant Major of the battalion, Sergeant Major, I'm, I'm going to get out. Um, this is what I'm, my plan is what I'm going to do. Uh, any ideas on ways you, I might be able to do something along those lines for my last few months? Because you need to have a different battery gunny in there. Someone's going to deploy with the unit, so I'm not going to deploy. And he said, well, I've got a, a friend over at uh, Division Datacom. Let me give him a call. So he sent me over to the Division Datacom uh, for my last six months. So I got to you know, work with the division on their setting up their field networks. And so I got a little more hands-on and a few things. I worked on some uh, routers and setting up interfaces on the routers, which I hadn't done before myself. So yeah, I got a little bit. I get I, what I was meaning was from the reverse where they were, did the Marine Corps look at, Hey, look at all this training he's no. getting. So they didn't utilize that skill set. Now there wasn't anything for them to utilize. Okay. I mean, I, I was in artillery. So they could care less about what my computer networking skills were, my computer <laughs> skills were, you know, it worked out well that I was able to use a database and organize things better for the unit before we go out on deployment and we get back and all of that. So my organizational skills and the fact that I was able to leverage my skills on a computer to, to be better at that helped, but the computer skills now. So your first stop after the out of the Marine Corps was where? Here in Temecula at what's now Motorola. At the time, the company was called uh, Plant Equipment, and they had been in business since 69. They made software and hardware for the emergency communications market, so 911 software. So pretty much if you dial 911 in the U.S. and someone answers, they're answering on their software and hardware, more than likely. They're the, they were the industry leader. And at that point in time was your, because the reason why I'm asking this is today you're a chief operations officer. Yes, so there, there was another transition for you, and I want to get into that. But yeah. this first stop, networks, computer networks, that type stuff, were you thinking that was your future? Yeah, at first when I got out, I had a different mindset. I said, you're in the core, and no matter what rank you're at, you're almost always in charge of somebody or something, right? And then as you progress, you're in charge of more people and more things. And it's like, you know what, maybe I want an individual comp contributor role. I don't want to have to be in a management role anymore. Let me just focus on this for a while. So that was my idea. And I was originally offered a job at Paula Casino when they were building it as a network admin. And whatever dollar amount they offered me and I accepted. And I had placed uh, my application or uh, give my resume and interviewed over here with Motorola now and had one or two interviews with them. I didn't really like the job because it was a supervisor's job and it was working on their software. It wasn't working on just Microsoft software and networks. It was working on their proprietary software for their technical support department. So I told them that I needed $10,000 more than what these guys had offered me. So I figured, you know what? I don't want to want that job. So for me to take it, it's got to be this much more money. The Paula called me and said, Hey, the engineer for the job quit. So everything's on hold for another couple of weeks. We'll get back to you. Motorola called me and said, we want to hire you, but we have to be fair to you. We have to pay you what the last person was making, which was another 3000 more than I had asked for. So it's like <sighs> an offer you couldn't refuse and turn it down. So, <laughs> you know, I, I took that, that job. And within two months, I wasn't working on systems. I was just managing people, managing processes. Exactly what you didn't want to do. Exactly what I thought I didn't <laughs> want to do. Right. So I spent a couple of years doing that and then realized there was another position open up a sales operations manager role uh, in another department and technical support is all problems. People only call you when there's problems, your people have to get fixed their problems. People are always complaining. So everything's a complaint on the sales side. They've got more money, bigger budget. They're having more <laughs> fun and they wanted someone who knew the technical piece of it because we're selling technical uh, right. systems, right? So I opted and went over there. Taking a, a brief step back, coming out after 12 years in the Marine Corps, was there a period of, uh, a two-part question, was there a period of apprehension coming out? And then two, was there ever a period of regret, like, man, I made the wrong decision? You know when the period, period of regret was? 9-11. Because I was still within the six-month window where I could have gone back in, kept my rank, my time and grade, all of that. And I was dating a lady at the time and she called me that morning and said, Hey, turn on the news. Somebody flew in the tower. And it's like, I'm sure everyone who 
that day had similar feelings and I was you know, that tempted to call and go back in. But my daughter's in the other room. It's like, they're not going to send me overseas anyways. They're not, no matter what happens, you're a single parent. You're going to get stuck here. They're going to fap you out to the range control or something like that. You're just going to sit around. So I didn't do it. So that's probably the, the, the one time that I regretted being out the most is, is that day. Was there apprehension for you coming out? Or were you, were you, I guess what I'm getting at was, did you have that thing of that's my past? I'm, I'm going to walk away from this. And, and you were excited about your future or was it kind of like, and I, I don't want to go down this rabbit hole and, and I apologize if I'm huh. implying it this way. You're, you kind of had to give it up to, to take on the role of being a parent. Yeah. Was no regrets about that at all. Okay. And so, and I really didn't have any apprehension getting out. I was probably the overly optimistic. I didn't have a job getting out. You know, I just said, I'm getting out. And I, I, Which, I felt at the time that my certifications, I'll get a job and I'll, I'll make enough money from the research that I'd done. These jobs were paying as much as I needed to make. I said, okay, I've got, you know, three months of, uh, accrued accru accru leave that I'm going to live off of. I'll get hired before then. And, you know, I look back now and I'll be probably much more conservative today <laughs> if I, if I had done that. But back then it's like, yeah, no problem. Wisdom makes us uh, more apprehensive. Yeah, doesn't it? Or age does. Age does. <laughs> College eventually became on your radar. When did that happen? Yeah, so that happened as I was the sales operations manager. I started looking around at people in, in the industry and their careers. And I realized that if I wanted to progress beyond just a manager, I was going to need to get my degree. And I figured, you know, I'd sunk in the money into... Uh, the GI bill at the time it was a hundred bucks a month for your first 12 months in, but now it was paying out 1600 bucks a month to go to school. So I, I invested 1200 bucks and they're going to pay me to go to school. So uh, I picked up, I think probably a year's worth of credits while I was in. And then some of my additional training gave me like another 12 to 14 units outside of the, uh, the college that I'd done while I was in. So I needed two years to finish up what I had. Because the, the academy gave me a semester, full semester. I picked up more while I was in the, in the core, and then some of my training counted. So, we're now was what degree did you end up getting? What did you get your degree in? Bachelor's of Business Management. And was it being driven by the work you were doing or work you wanted to do? Probably more of the work I was doing because I, I felt that a general business management, business administration degree was going to give me the most flexibility. I wasn't working on something that required a specific degree per se. Instead, I needed more general business knowledge, if anything, and that would be applicable to multiple positions in the future. And your transition to chief operating officer, because you're now several companies in, and, yeah. and we don't need to go through each and every one, unless there's an aspect of a story that you feel is beneficial for somebody to hear who's making their transition. But my overarching goal is to address what you're doing today as a chief operating officer. Explain to somebody who doesn't know what that is and what drew you into that position. Yeah. So I'll try to boil this down so it doesn't become too boring, but I think one of the things that I found either that I gravitated towards in the Marine Corps, the Marine Corps taught me, or maybe it's, it was natural to me is the ability to organize and build repeatable processes. If you think about the military and probably law enforcement to a large degree, you need to repeat the same thing over and over again with new people all the time. So you have to build effective processes to train people, to get things done, to accomplish the same sorts of things over and over again, but with new people, you're always getting new people, but the mission stays the same to a large degree, right? So you learn how to build process. You learn how to implement process and organization and you learn how to train people because those same people need to be able to do the job and understand what has to get done. If you need 10 people to do it, but now you only have six, you still have to get the job done. So you end up training people that way. And that sort of lends itself to operations in general, you know, the training of people, they're working with HR, implementing the right systems to optimize what the company needs to do, you know, shrink the, the workforce down naturally so you don't have to have so many people to do the same thing and that just started to sort of be the, how i was proceeding in my career and was, was making me successful was leveraging that and building upon that 
were you finding that the companies you were working for were looking for that skill set that from being in the military or was that just uh oh and he happens to be in the military yeah i don't think they were looking for the military per se uh i think the motorola company valued it the guy who had uh first hired me was I forget how it worked out, but he ended up being an officer in the Navy working at the White House on communications, but he started as an enlisted. And I forget how the uh, it went. So he understood the military. And so I think he understood the value that somebody coming out of the military could bring. But what I, what I found over the years is that what I noticed from people coming out of the military or out of law enforcement, um, or you know, really any first responder t- type of uh, job, is those people tend to look for solutions and in absence of direction, they will still try to find a solution and accomplish the job where a lot of times I find, you know, people that just come come out of school, they'll stall and wait for direction. And we, we've always been taught, this is what you need to accomplish or you think when you accomplish absent instructions, you still have to move forward. You've got to find some way to move forward. And that seems to be valuable in the workforce. Did you ever have a point where your military bearing, I'll, I'll use the word bearing, was a detriment to you oh, once yeah. you were on the private side? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, how would I put it? So you're dealing with somebody else in the, who's been in the military. Okay, I think we, we both understand the difference between passion and anger. Mm-hmm. Okay, so I can be passionate about something. I can be upset about a situation. I can verbally express the fact that I'm upset about the situation uh, and they don't take offense. They get it. Everybody understands and let's figure it out and move it. It's nothing personal. We'll have beers later on. People who haven't been around that, they feel that oftentimes they feel that you're yelling at them, that you're attacking them or their abilities. And it's, it's difficult to understand that from, from my perspective at first it was because like, why are you getting upset? It has nothing to do with you. It has everything to do with the situation. <laughs> but they, they would get upset about it. Um, and so it was a learning process for me, too, on you know how to deal with people, you know how to be a little more empathetic in those types of situations, be a more effective leader on the outside, because you're not always dealing with the military. And it, if you carry that into the civilian force, it can be a detriment. For somebody looking or coming up on their transition, what would be your piece of advice in learning how to tone down that bearing or trying to be more empathetic? You know, was there anything that worked for you or that you specifically did? Well, I married the HR manager. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) That's an easy way to to fend off the complaints. No, it wasn't fending off the complaints, but but she, but she, 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 she would tell me, you can't talk like that. So here's how people hear you. I said, but, but that's not what I'm saying. So she would say, that doesn't matter what you're saying. It matters what they're hearing. And you have to think about how people hear you and think about how they're processing the information. And for someone who's never been around you, you come off very intense. <laughs> so I don't feel, I said, I've toned it down so much. You should have seen me when I was a drill instructor. It was entirely different. She was, but for them, you're extremely intense and it puts them on the defensive and they take everything that you're saying at personally. So it, it takes a lot, a lot of time. And sometimes I'll still catch myself, but it's probably also why when I'm hiring people, you know, I actively look for, for military, for former military, because I know what I'm getting and I know that they can deal with me. And the other thing I do during hiring now is I tell people up front, can you handle this? You know, can you push back on me? Can you tell me that's a dumb idea? I don't care. You know, are, are you comfortable pushing back like that? Or does that, does that make you uncomfortable? Because I'm going to throw out, this is what we have to do. Here's how we should do it. That doesn't mean you have to follow exactly what I say. That's just how I start the conversation. And I want you to evaluate that and say, I don't like that. We should do it this way. This is why I think it's, this is a better way of doing it. And now we have a back and forth conversation because that's always what I've been used to before. And I operate better that way. But I give people that advance notice now. And then I start, I look for people shutting down. And if you see them start to shut down, it's like, okay, maybe I need to slow down and calm down and just stop giving direction and instead start asking 
I started listening more. And I, I did start changing the way that I hold meetings, the way that we put information together. Uh, now I kind of lay out what we have to do and then start at the lowest level and say, okay, what are the ideas? Let's, let's put them all around. You know, Before I ever start saying, this is what I think we should do, because that then shuts down the conversation. What I'll wait until after the fact and say, okay, this is good, this is good. Maybe we can do this. What does anybody think about if we did this other thing? And by then people are a little more open and they're willing to contribute. So when you made the decision to switch from network administration and, and overseeing that, you went to the sales world for a little while. <clears throat> what was your first venture into operations and what did what was the biggest thing you had to learn or looking back on hindsight, somebody coming in brand new, what's the biggest piece of advice in the operations realm? You know, it's, it's an interesting question that I haven't thought about before because I kind of eased myself into it from sales operations where I was still asked to look at the systems from a technical standpoint, but organize the sales operations department. So you know, it was a subtle change from something you were already doing. Yeah. So it's like, okay, I've still got the technical piece, <laughs> uh, but they want me to organize two different departments to accomplish these things. And our, our CEO at the time, when they put me in the role, he said, look, your job is to make us easier to do business with. So make that your primary focus. So I always kept it in the back of my mind as I tried to organize things. Is this going to make us easier to do business with? And that was, that was the approach and just started organizing things you know, a little bit different each time. And then, it, you know, it ended up reaching the pinnacle that I could reach it or the, not the pinnacle, but the level that I could reach at that company. And it was time to go find another company that would give me more responsibility. And that is definitely one of my questions down the road, but I want to hit on one real quick. So if somebody was active right now, they're thinking, you know what, I want to go into an operations role at a company when I come out. What did, what's the piece of advice you would say to, to bring to the table? So for, for pure operations, uh, one, I think that if you're going to work in operations, on the technical side, you're going to need to have some Excel skills. You need to be able to plan and organize and analyze. If you're going to be effective in operations, you have to be able to analyze to get to the real data to then make your decision based off of the data. Okay. One of the things that I, I did struggle with at first was being able to communicate why this was a better way to go. I knew instinctively we should be doing this. And I felt that I was right all the time but I couldn't explain it well enough in the business world. And so I started getting into analytics and that's where I found, I think probably my true calling in operations was understanding the analytics and the data and how I could use data to make the case for where we needed to go. And I remember one time the gentleman that hired me here at Motorola, we were, uh, I was trying to make a case for buying some software that was going to make us more efficient. And we had, a new system that we were selling for 911 and we had a new way that uh, I'd built this program that made it faster to quote the system because these are complex systems and I it used to take us a couple days to quote a full system because it's software it's hardware computers you know, cabling all kinds of stuff and I built out this this thing in Excel and through another program that we could do them in 30 minutes I said okay and I built a case for why we needed the software and my new boss had said, look, I suggest you go talk to the other executives and present that individually to them and get their feedback. So I'd gone around and presented my case to different executives. And I got to this one who had originally hired me in tech support. And he said, you're wrong. Okay. Why am I wrong? He said, because you've already built this other thing that makes this system quote faster. So you should need less software, less people you can do it faster. And I started thinking about this. Well, that's interesting. I hadn't thought about it that way. So I went back and I pulled more data and the data showed that this system was the one we quoted the most of. And even though we got it done in 30 minutes, we were quoting it 18 times for every one time we quoted another system. So 
each quote was only 30 minutes, but I had to produce so many more quotes. It actually required more people right. than what I was asking for. So I'm back to him. I said, yeah, I, I took what you had said and here's the data. When I looked at it differently, you're right. 30 minutes for this quote, four hours for this one, eight hours for this one, but we're doing 18 of these. So when you extrapolate it, I'm going to need more people. And he said, okay, I get your point now, but it made me think differently. It made me put the data together to make my case. And like, we got the software and I got the people and it worked out. It worked out the way it's supposed to. And along these same lines, so you talked about uh, a skill set with Excel and, mm -hmm. and, you know, basically working well with people from a college standpoint is, is a business degree what you would recommend or is it, or in 2022, is there a different degree you would now recommend for somebody to kind of target? No, in operations, I would recommend a business degree a general business degree with an emphasis on analytics. And for you, you mentioned that you, with that company, you hit your ceiling and you went looking for another company. And so for me, I'd like to talk to you about, I hear this often for those of us who, who are looking to go to the private side is that it's constantly, and it's, it's the norm. You're always looking for your next job. Is that a, a common practice or was that something just personally driven by you? at this time it was driven by me. I mean, for the longest time I, I was very happy at Motorola. I was there for maybe seven years, very happy, but I guess my, my personality, my nature is I want to keep growing, whatever it is. And so I was happy there for a while, um, moved over to this new job. They, then they gave me more responsibility. It was like, this is great. But then it, it got to the point where my boss, who's a good guy said, look, if you can get the job done in 30 hours a week and play golf the rest of the time, I'm fine with that. And had reached that point. I was getting the job done in 30 hours a week. I could have played golf if I played golf back then. And it was boring. There was no challenge. Right. It's like, okay. You're I, talking about golf, right? <laughs> I'm, not, I'm terrible at golf. I've, I have learned how to play, but it just doesn't play terribly. Uh, but the job wasn't fun. It was just, there was no challenge. I go into work. I knew exactly what I had to do. My team was working great. We get everything done. It's like, okay, I'm going to take off. And there was nothing. So I went to them and said, is there something more? Uh, there wasn't. I was offered another job in a place in San Diego as a director. So I gave notice and like, no, you got to stay. So they countered, they came over the top big times. So like, okay, I'll stay. But a year later, it was still the same thing. The, the money was okay, but I needed more than just the money. You were looking for kind of personal satisfaction, yeah. more than financial satisfaction. Yeah, what do you call it? Self-actualization, right? I'm trying to reach that point in my career and it wasn't getting there. Now, being entrenched in the computer world, computer networks, that type environment, to today where you're involved in the sports industry, was was that change driven by your desire to leave the computer industry, or what kind of prompted that change? Yeah, so once I moved over into, into sales operations, um, from that point on, I became less concerned about the technology. and I w That was no longer a driver for me to stay attached to that at all. It was good that I had the background and that's helped me throughout my career because I've been able to translate between the technical side and the management side. And so in each of my, uh, many of my subsequent roles, the IT departments have reported to me. So at least I can decipher what they're saying or the BS or me, <laughs> are we really getting things done? Um, but I didn't care about staying in the technical world anymore. And that's really where I made more of a push to pure operate business operations is after leaving Motorola. And so the company you're with today, Bravo Sports, yeah. they're primarily um, skateboards, scooters, that... Sk skateboards, they're probably the largest manufacturers of skateboards in the world. Um, that's half our business is the high-end skateboards. Um, we have some top athletes. We have the, the youngest Olympian in history, uh, Sky Brown. I think she won a bronze at 13 years old. Wow. Yeah. Um so that's half our that's business. A, that's, that's amazing to think that a 13-year-old has the, the drive and determination to get to Olympic level performance. You should watch some of the stuff this girl can do. She is amazing to watch. It's, it's scary to me. I would never do that. I'm old and stiff. There's no <laughs> way. Um, yeah, so that's half the business. The other half is what we call, uh, well, that's half, maybe 15% of it is with protection. So bicycle helmets, uh, pads, skateboard helmets, el things like that. And then we have the mass market side of the business, which is a bunch of other brands where you'll see our, that stuff in Target, Walmart, Costco. So we've got 
ATVs, ride on scooters, less expensive skateboards, that kind of thing. Your first sports company, though, was actually Continental Tire. I, I loosely call it a sports company, Continental Tires, correct? Continental Tires owned the company that I was the president of. Was the was any component of that change related to you being involved in triathlon or, or kind of having a, a dr- driving factor? Maybe the other way around. It it drove you into triathlon. So I I done the tri- I had done the San Diego triathlon I told you about before, and I had a bike. Um, when they approached me to take over Highway Two is the name of the company as as the president. I wasn't a big bike rider. Every time I went out to ride with my friends, I was always in pain. So when I started there, all the guys there are avid road cyclists. And so they immediately changed the setup of my bike. And all of a sudden (laughs) I was like, wow, this doesn't hurt. It's fun. So then I got into it a lot more. Are they based in the United States ultimately? No. So Continental's out of Germany. So they own half of the business. And then Seller Royale. They're an Italian company. But aren't they primary saddles? Primarily saddles. The, the company Cellar Royale is saddles, but they have four brands. Oh, okay. So they have Cellar Royale. They have Physique, which is saddles and shoes. Um, they have Crank Brothers, which is mountain bike, and then they have uh, Brooks England, which is like leather saddles, leather goods, a different style of, of right. bicycle. Yeah. So those are the, so those were the Continental and those four brands were the owning brands, and then we had three other brands that we distributed as well, also in the cycling world. So you were immersed in the cycle. I was immersed in it. Yeah. Did you get to go to the tour or any other grand state? No, COVID hit. Oh, <laughs> we're supposed to. So our board meeting, my first board meeting was over in Frankfurt. I was over there for that. And I thought we're going to have the next board meeting uh, in Paris at the tour. So you get to see the tour, Ryan. And then COVID hits. <laughs> so yeah, no, no, didn't get to go to the tour. And, and so going back to where you're talking about how your desire for, for more self-actualization prompted you to leave one company what prompted you to leave hi, i'm sorry what was highway it? two highway two and go to uh, bravo sports so highway two is the president i had everything but it was a small smaller company okay right so i had taken them from 53 million to about 76 million when i left but it was small and as a distributor of cycling goods and the owning partners wanted to stay very narrowly focused on the way they wanted to do things. And I was looking to grow. I wanted to grow the business. And initially the board members that hired me had said they wanted to grow the business. And then as I started pushing ideas to grow, it's like, no, we'll wait on that. We'll wait on that. We'll wait on that. Like, okay, this is getting, it's just the same old thing every day. And it wasn't doing much for me. So Bravo sports was a little bit bigger. Uh, they were trying to grow their private equity owned. And I had never worked with private equity before. So I thought it would be a good transition for me to uh, go to the private equity side of the house and see what I can do there. And as a COO, then I could focus entirely on just operations. And I didn't have to worry so much about the sales and marketing side of things. The CEO is going to deal with that. So, but, but now you're, are you in charge of hiring with this company or involved in the hiring process with Bravo sports? Yeah, everybody in the operations side. Sure. And then any of the key leadership roles, sure. The CEO and I, I'll be part of the interviewing team ultimately before we hire anybody that's at a senior level. So putting on your hiring hat for somebody listening who might be interested in wanting to come for work for your company, what do they, what do you want them to bring to the table for you guys? Yeah. So it depends on the role, right? So you know, from, from my side, I recently just hired a Marine on my, on the planning side of things. So uh, demand planning for product uh, placing orders. And so he needed to have the analytics. He needed to have the understanding of the mass market side because that's where he was going to go work for is uh, fulfilling Amazon, Target, Costco, Walmart, and their needs and how that works. So it's, it's, it's kind of a role where you've got to start at the bottom and learn your way up into it. But once you have the skills, then there's a, a demand for your, for your skills because each of those businesses operate in a certain way. You can't just jump into it without any understanding of it. Um, is it possible to get that level of knowledge while still being active? No. Okay. Not on planning. Not, not, not on planning. Again, the straight business degree emphasis on analytics and organization, uh, project management. So you can get project management while you're in the service. You can work on projects and you can develop project management skills. Project management is desperately needed in most businesses that I've been at. Someone who really understands how to manage a project, keep things on track, uh, communicate well with the, throughout the organization about the status of the project, keep things moving. Uh, 
every time I can find someone like that, it's gold. From the flip side, though, for those that you haven't hired that have come from the military, what's what's their biggest hurdle that they're not overcoming for you? For me, it depends on the role. Or the company you worked for. Yeah, yeah. I'm trying to think back to the times that I haven't hired somebody in the military. Normally, it's been because they've lacked the experience in the area that I need. Somebody requires some level of experience. They're not uh, more basic level positions, right? So they, they don't have some experience somewhere. It doesn't have to be a lot for me on the military because I know what you can do if you're in the military. And if you've worked around something and you understand the, the terms, you understand the business in general, then you'll quickly pick up our systems. But if you've never worked on any of the business systems or the types of business systems that we use or work with our customers or customers like that and just don't understand the flow of the business, it's too difficult to, to teach at a higher level. Entry level, sure, you can start you at an entry level, you know, but that's an 18 to 20 hour, dollar an hour job. And you just left something where you're making more than that. So you don't want that. But bottom line is come to the table with a, a college degree if you want the executive level or oh, yeah. operational level, uh, manager level positions. Yeah, you, you're going to need a degree. You're, you're not going to get, even today, it'd be tough to get to the manager level Especially, especially not going straight in. I mean, you might work your way up over years to the manager level without a degree, but you're not going to get beyond that. You're just not. If somebody's got more specific questions, they, can they reach out to you specifically? Yeah, happy to. What's the best way to get in touch with you? Uh, LinkedIn's always an easy way. Okay. Yeah, people can always get me on LinkedIn. I'll put that in the show notes. Yeah. Any last pieces of advice you can give to somebody, you know, from your experience and transitioning out? I would just say you know, don't underestimate the leadership skills and the ability to figure problems out on the fly and how valuable that is. And that's needed in the business world. and It's, it's sorely lacking and it'll be valued and it, it, that will help move you up within a company quickly. The culture of, of today has changed a little bit. And I know more law enforcement tends to deal with this moving into the private sector is military embraced on the private sector side or, or is there any type of, of pushback? And I'm, I'm leaning it towards the idea of you're an oppressor is, is kind of the mentality that some people are bringing to law enforcement coming into the private sector. You know, I, I don't see that with military. Okay. I don't see that with military. Uh, I see a lot of people more that respect the fact that people uh, have been in the military I think they understand that they've gone through something they don't understand and they respect it. I've never seen anybody react to anybody like they were an oppressor or anything along those lines. Oftentimes it's been a little more reverence than anything else. Cool. I appreciate your time, sir. Thank you. I appreciate you watching, but before you go, if you like the video, please hit that subscribe button. Also any comments are appreciated. Thank you.